Hey, welcome to the Savvy Ladies Wednesday Wisdom. My name is Lisa Ernst. I'm the Executive Director of Savvy Ladies. Before we get started, a reminder that we'll have a few minutes at the end of the presentation for your questions. Feel free to type your questions into the chat window. I'm so pleased to introduce to you today uh, Esalt Conlin. Esalt is a bond trader for one of the largest buy-side asset management firms in the world and is responsible for U.S. dollar investment grade fixed income credit trading. Ms. Conlin earned a BA degree in economics and psychology magna cum laude from New York University. One more fact you should know about Esalt is that at the age of 17, she walked into a local brokerage office and bought her first stock. Her passion and knowledge for the stock market started earlier than most. So welcome, Isalt, and I will hand over the presentation to you. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa, for the introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here to talk about the basics of stocks and the stock market, uh, and very happy to be presenting for Savvy Ladies, which I think is a fantastic organization uh, geared towards financial empowerment of women. Uh, let me just start by saying that financial literacy is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart uh, because I truly believe that anyone can understand it, and sometimes it feels like friends or family or even the media make it a lot more complicated than it is. But I promise you that anyone can understand it. It just takes breaking it down into its component parts, um, and I'm going to try and do that today for you. This presentation is aimed at the very basics of stocks, what they really are, what they represent, what is their value, and how they work in general. For those investing pros, this webinar might be somewhat simplistic, but it should be a good opportunity to ground yourself and take you back to the basics. For those new to stocks and the investing world, this will be a good place to get your feet wet and get a very basic understanding of stocks. But the most important thing when it comes to investing, whether that be in stocks or bonds or anything else for that matter, is that you understand the underlying thing that you are investing in, right? What is this thing that I'm investing in? So with that, let's, uh, let's get started here. So what do you do um, when you don't understand something, right? Well, oh, that didn't work. Hold on one sec. Uh, looks like my slides are getting, hmm not playing. That's not working. Do you guys see that slide there? There we go. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for who's ever controlling that. Um, do you guys, are you guys controlling that from uh, Savvy Ladies? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, you should be able to also, but, um, but I just moved that slide. Okay. Yeah, for some reason it's uh, it's not allowing me to move it. Oh, let's try now here. Sorry for this, guys. Um, there we go. Does that mean okay. it? Okay, perfect. So, anyway, sorry about that, guys. So, what's the first thing that you do when you don't understand something, right? You Google it, or at least that's the first thing that I do. Hopefully other people do the same thing. But so let's see what happened when we Google what is a stock. So the first thing you see is you get 1.7 billion, I guess, results. So that's great. You know, that's really going to help us out. So let's read some of these definitions here. Uh, so the goods or merchandise kept on the premises of a business or warehouse. That's not exactly what we're looking for. The capital raised by a business or corporation through the issue and subscription of shares. A little bit closer to what we're looking for. There's some other things and, you know, some adjectives a verb, something having to do with a rifle. So clearly we're getting a little bit um, out of where we need to be. But so anyway, this still doesn't really help me because, you know, it's talking in this sort of professional jargon that I don't quite understand. So I say, please speak English. This still makes no sense to me. Okay, so the next thing is, what if we had a visual? I'm a very visual learner. So sometimes I think a picture can help me understand something. So let's see what we have here when I think stock market and visuals. Uh, okay, a stock certificate from Gerber. So Gerber was actually acquired by another public company, so maybe that isn't the best example here. Um, okay, the NASDAQ, which is a stock exchange. This is a centralized place where stocks can be bought and sold by interested parties. This helps a little, but it still doesn't really tell me what a stock is. 
Next, we have the New York Stock Exchange, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, where people are sort of um, you know, yelling, screaming at each other, and throwing paper around. And then we have a chart of some sort. I don't really know what this is, something having to do with price and time. The point is, this still isn't helping me understand what a stock is. So to understand what a stock is, let's start from the way beginning. So let's start with the foundation. That is the economy. I want you to think of the economy as the foundation of a house and a stock as sort of the wood frames that make up the house. Or I guess in you know this day and age, it's probably vinyl siding, but you, you guys kind of get the point. So what is the economy? The economy is a big, global, interconnected network of people, businesses, and money. And although some of us may hate to admit it, money is what allows the economy to function. The channels of borrowing and lending and investing sort of keep the world in working order. So I sort of threw in some examples here. How would milk be at your bodega every morning? Uh, I'm using bodega because I live in New York City and I usually go to bo a bodega instead of a grocery store. Um, how would the subway be able to run without gasoline? How would you be able to call your grandmother in Florida without a cell phone tower? The economy functions because of businesses, small businesses mainly, and things like money, capital, people, and investment. And to show the interconnectedness of the economy, I drew in a bunch of arrows to hammer out this point, and this was probably the most fun I had with this entire PowerPoint, <laughs> just drawing these arrows. So you must be wondering, okay, when are we going to get to a point? When are you gonna teach me what a stock is? Well, we're pretty close. So again, we are on the foundation of the, of the house, which is the economy. What does the economy need to function? It needs small businesses, because that is how we make food, build computers, pay salaries, but now we are getting closer to sort of the wood frames of the house, right? That's where the stock falls in or where stocks fall in. So what are your options for starting a business? Probably everyone on this webinar has thought about starting a business, you know, at one point or another. So option one, borrow money from a bank. This is taking out a loan. Most people associate this with you know, student loans, or another example can be taking out a mortgage to buy a house. A loan means that the bank gives you a lump sum payment, depending on what you need, that you eventually have to pay back. This type of borrowing is considered debt. Debt requires you to pay the full amount of the borrowed money back in the future, and since the bank is lending you that money, they require you to pay interest, usually twice a year or monthly in some cases, for being able to borrow that money. Also, very important, a bank has to approve you as a borrower when they lend to you. So they require a lot of paperwork and they check your credit rating. So that's option one. Next, option two, borrow money from a friend. This is how most businesses get started. People borrow money from friends or family because it's easy, it's accessible, and if you have a good idea, some people may be more than, more than willing to lend you money. But this is still a loan in essence. You have to pay back your friend or family member, but maybe you can get away without paying interest. But most likely, you have to pay back your friends with more money than you originally borrowed, so I guess all in all, it's kind of a wash. And in worst case scenario, maybe you borrowed money from your mobster friends here, and the consequences of not paying them back can be you know, fairly scary. So, Finally, we get to option three, and we're getting closer now. Option three is borrow money from a bunch of people who invest in you. For the company, there is no dealing with a bank, you don't have to pay back a loan, you aren't paying interest on a loan, and you don't have to deal with family members or scary mobsters either. So you may say, okay, well, how is this different from option two where you borrow from a friend? This time you're just borrowing from, you know, multiple people. Well, it is different because in exchange for investing your money, the company in return offers you a stake in their company. We call this equity financing. So finally, I think we've 
gotten to the point, which is sort of the ding, 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 we've sort of defined what a stock is. A stock is just a stake in a company. That's all it is. A company asks you to invest in them, and in return, they offer you a stake or a share of stock in their company. So let's uh, read this sort of blue highlighted box here because I think it's very important. A stake is just a share of stock. When you hear things like, this company just went public, it means they are raising money from many people. In order to raise money, a company agrees to issue a certain number of shares of stock to anyone in the public who is willing to invest in them. This benefits the company because they don't have to pay back any money. They're not taking on any debt. They have minimized the financial danger of the company's original owners, and if the business fails, the losses are spread among many investors, which, you know, from our standpoint, isn't that great. We don't really want that to happen. So, so here's the big question. Why the heck does Wall Street make it so complicated? Um, you know, and I got to tell you, because I work on Wall Street, and I know how people can sort of speak in this you know, very technical jargon and, and almost intimidate you, don't let them. Don't let Wall Street make you think it's complicated. When you own a stock, you are part owner, along with thousands of other people, of a company. So, for example, if a company has 100 shares of stock outstanding and you own one share, you are one over 100 or 1% 1 owner of that company. You can literally tell your friends that, you know, I own a company. And what people tend to miss is you actually have a claim on all of the cash, equipment, inventory, buildings, chairs, tables, computers, whatever, you name it. You have a claim on all of those things. Um, so it really is that simple. simple. That is what a stock is. So you may be asking yourself, why do people say that stocks are really risky? Well, Think about it. You're an investor. You lend money to a company. You have no guarantee that you will get that money back. Remember, in a loan, someone has to eventually pay the person back. In equity financing, which is what a stock is, there is no guarantee that the investor, you know, you or me, gets their money back at all. The company could go bust and you could essentially lose all your money. So, the only way to get any of your money back when you own a stock is being able to trade it. Trade it with someone else who wants to buy it. And you hope that when you sell your stock, it's at the same price or higher than when you bought it. And th these prices are determined through supply and demand in the marketplace, among many other factors. And I don't go into too much depth on the stock market in these slides, but the stock market is just the centralized place that stocks are bought and sold. And it was sort of just a matter of evolution that someone decided it would be a lot easier if everyone who wanted to buy and sell stocks could just be in one room to engage in these transactions. That made a lot of sense. It facilitated trading in that sense. That's all that the New York Stock Exchange is. So, why investing in stocks is important. I could just sack all my cash in a savings account at my local bank and sort of save that way, right? Sure, but the economy and all the businesses in it can only flourish if people are willing to invest, i.e. stocks, or lend and borrow, i.e. loans and other types of debt. Stock ownership is a form of investment for people like me and you and a form of raising funds for a corporation. And the way I like to think about it is my favorite picture here, I hate spending money, but the economy needs me. That's kind of how I act every single time I go into a store and then I come out with way too much stuff. <laughs> so this next slide, we're gonna get a little bit more technical, but this is important. How do you define stocks, right? Well, usually we think about it by one size, two style, and three sector. So remember what a stock is. It's just a proportionate ownership claim in a company because you invested a certain amount of money in that company. So you can define your investment 
by size of the company. There's a term called market capitalization, and it's the current stock price multiplied by the total number of shares outstanding. And we hear this term used a lot in the financial media. So the higher your stock price goes, the higher the market capitalization of the company. It's just a basic equation. For those into you know, the financial jargon, a large cap or a large capitalization company is one with a market cap of 10 billion or higher. That's companies like IBM, Apple, Home Depot, uh, Microsoft. Mid cap companies are usually between two and 10 billion and small cap is two billion or smaller. And most people are saying small two billion, how is that possible? Well, when you're a very large public company, you know, small is actually two billion or less. The next thing you can look at is style. Is the company a mature company that has been around for more than five years? Do they have steady income, steady cash flows, things like that? That would be a value company or a mature company. A growth company, on the other hand, is one in which it's uncertain whether this company is going to succeed. I usually think of Apple in the 1990s, for example. Uh, I wish I had bought that stock back then. Uh, <laughs> growth companies are usually the riskier types of investments, but they have the potential for above average earnings growth or you know, revenue growth. Also in the style category is cyclical versus non-cyclical. This defines how correlated the company is to fluctuations in the economy. Think about it as, is this a luxury versus is this a necessity? For a cyclical company, you can think of cars, fine dining, brands like uh, Coach, you know, department stores like Saks Fifth Avenue. For a non-cyclical company, think, you know, drug stores. If you get sick, obviously you're going to go buy some cold medication. You can think of utility companies like Con Edison um, or even tobacco companies. Most sort of addictions are considered, you know, non-cyclical. So then you can also define a stock by its sector, and I like to separate stocks into financials, industrials, and utilities. Everyone does it differently, but this seems to be the easiest for me. So next, what is a stock really worth? Well, this is much more of an art than a science, and if you tune into my webinar next week, Bonds 101, an introduction to bonds in the fixed income market, you will see that determining the price of a bond is much more mathematical and fairly black and white, whereas pricing a stock, it's kind of a gray exercise. But before I do that, I want to ask a question to the group. So I'm going to give everyone 20 seconds to think about this. So here's the question. Is a $10 stock cheaper than a $100 stock? So I'm going to give everyone, let's call it 20 seconds to think about that. Okay, ready? Hopefully that was 20 seconds. So, here's the answer. Well, the answer is sort of no, maybe, we don't really know yet. I guess it's kind of a trick question here because sure, literally, a $10 stock is cheaper than a $100 stock based off of you know dollar increments. But the real answer is no. A $10 stock isn't necessarily cheaper than a $100 stock. It all depends on the underlying fundamentals of a company. Every stock price is a gauge the market is placing in what that company is worth. So let's think about it this way. You go into a store and you see a really nice blouse. It's priced at $45. You make an assessment of its value right then and there. We all do it. You decide that you think it's only worth $25, and that's based off of your assessment of the quality of the material, similar blouses, the brand name of the blouse, things like that. You value the price of a stock the exact same way, but you use qualities about the company in your judgment of its value. So what kind of qualities, you ask? There's many, but 
we're going to talk about a few of them here. One of them is things like revenue, right? How much do they make? Sales, earnings. So there's a ratio called price to earnings. It's a ratio that represents how much money, price, you are paying for each unit of earnings. Investors usually compare PE, price to earnings ratios, by industry, and some people think of PE ratios as how long a stock will take to pay your investment back if there is no change. Another one that investors like to use is price to book. It's a ratio that represents the value of a company if it was torn up and sold today. So the book value includes equipment, buildings, land, stock, bonds. Remember all those things I told you you had a claim on? That's what book value would be. And the last one, which a lot of people care about, is the dividend yield, the price over your annual dividend. So you can think of dividend yield as the interest on your money. Remember there was interest when you took out a loan? Well, there's also technically interest on a stock. It's not the same thing, but it's called a dividend. It's the dividend yield is sort of, you know, what someone is giving you every year to own that stock. That's something something that companies do. And the dividend yield is very attractive to many investors who are looking for steady income. Think retirees. Now there are many more ratios that people use to the to determine the value of a stock, but most people like to compare ratios across sectors or styles, as we talked about in the previous slide. So if two companies do the same thing and are of similar size, you would think that their price to earnings multiple, remember that PE or that price to book, it should be fairly similar, right? So say we're comparing Home Depot and Lowe's. They're both big home improvement stores. Home Depot's price to earnings multiple, let's say, is 22 times. And when we say multiple, remember, it's just a ratio. It's just a way to take a stock price and normalize it so that we can compare things on an apples to apples comparison. That's why that $10 stock was not necessarily cheaper than that $100 stock. We're not comparing it against something. We need to normalize it. So at 22 times, remember we said Home Depot was trading at 22 times or it had a price to earnings multiple of 22 times. It means that Home Depot stock price trades at 22 times its annual earnings or revenue. So what about Lowe's? Lowe's trades, let's say, at 20 times PE, price to earnings. What stock is cheaper if we were only using this ratio to determine value? So Home Depot 22 times, Lowe's 20 times. Think about that for a second. So the answer is, Lowe's is cheaper, right? You only have to pay 20 times for its annual earnings, whereas with Home Depot, you had to pay 22 times. So obviously, there are many more things that go into valuing a stock, but many smart investors rely on the price to earnings multiple in their analysis, and it's one of the biggest ones that they rely on. So, hopefully we're on time. We're sort of getting to the end here. Um, you're probably thinking, you know, one, when am I going to stop talking because you're bored? But otherwise, um, I will leave you with this. Um, start to think about whether you want to invest in stocks. How much money do you actually have to invest in stocks? The first thing you need to do, if you do want to invest in stocks, is you need to open up a brokerage account. And I would say that most brokerage accounts need a minimum of $2,000 to open, but that may vary by company. And there are a variety of choices. You know, there's companies like Fidelity, Capital One, Scott Trade, TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, um, Charles Schwab. They all have great online capabilities that will allow you to get started, you know, with trading stocks and investing. And I would highly recommend that you sit down with a registered representative at one of these brokerage firms to sort of talk about your goals, your risk tolerance, taxes, fees, anything else you're wondering about. And this should be a free meeting, so if the company makes you pay for this, just walk away. You should be able to just get advice about this if you're thinking about opening up a brokerage account. They should also teach you about different products available for investment. We learned about just stocks today, the wooden boards of the house, the analogy that wasn't so great that I used. There are other products. Um, that throw a bunch of stocks together so that the investment is a little bit more diversified and then they package that and, as one product and sell it. That's an example of a mutual fund or an ETF 
The difference there being that one can trade intraday, the other can trade only at the end of day at a specified net asset value. But anyway, we're getting way too complicated there. Just be glad that now as you start to invest, you know exactly what you are investing in when you pick a stock. You know what that thing represents. Um, after you open up a brokerage account, it's time to start researching companies. That's bullet point four on that slide. Read as much as you can. Start reading the Wall Street Journal. Uh, ask for a prospectus of a mutual fund. You know, even if you don't know what that is, ask for one and see what it is. Read stuff that you don't understand. I'm telling you, you will eventually start to understand it and ask lots and lots of questions. Um, you know, as Lisa said in the beginning, I had no idea what I was doing when I started investing at 17. I had my mom help me open up a brokerage account, and I can remember the first stock I bought was PetMed Express, and I'll never forget it. It was a company that supplied pharmaceuticals door-to-door -door for your pets, uh, and I thought it was this genius idea. Uh, it was the only stock I held in my portfolio, my entire portfolio for a while. That was the only thing I owned because I didn't have much money at all at that point, um, and it did fairly well. I eventually sold it as I decided there were better opportunities elsewhere, um, but the company is still in existence, so I guess it was an okay choice. But again, a lot of my investing was complete trial and error. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Invest in more than just one stock um, and learn about the options you have out there for different things to invest in, different products. And don't be afraid just to try. Remember, it's it's all trial and error, and every great investor has successes and failures. I've had a variety of successes and a variety of really bad failures. Um, but most importantly, I would say for your own financial health, you should be an investor. You know, it's the only way the economy can continue to function, and it also helps you out a lot, especially with, you know, whether you want to retire or not. And it starts with just me and you. So... With that, I'll say that's sort of the conclusion of my presentation. I really appreciate everyone who took the time to listen to this today. And if you did enjoy learning about the basics of stocks, please join me next week, um, same day, same time, for Bond 101, an introduction to bonds and the fixed income markets. Um, but thank you so much. I hope everyone has a wonderful day, uh, and I appreciate everyone listening. Thanks, you saw that. Really appreciate it. We have a couple questions, so I just um, do you have a couple minutes to answer them? Sure, of course. Um, so the first question is: Is there an easy way to understand what a mutual fund is? That's a great question. Well, if you follow this presentation, you'll have a good foundation for what that is. But the easiest way I can describe it is: We learned what a stock was. A mutual fund, if we're talking about stock mutual funds, there's obviously different kinds of mutual funds, but if we're talking about just a stock mutual fund, is when you take a bunch of different stocks and put them together and you sell that as one product. It's, it's a product and a mutual fund also has a price on it. So it's a little bit different. So think about a mutual fund as just many stocks put together and then they sell this, you know, package thing as something and there's a price on that. So that's right. kind of what companies do to create sort of immediate diversification. Because if you just own one stock, all of your risk of your portfolio is just in this one company, whereas a mutual fund, many different stocks, many different companies. And so you get sort of this automatic diversification in your portfolio by, by owning a mutual fund. Great. Thanks. Um, the second question um, has to do with the fees that the brokerage houses um, charge. because. Yeah. You, as you mentioned, they'll sit down with you and make some suggestions, but when you start to trade, they compete for your business, correct? Right. There's different fees um, for, you know, different companies. There's usually a fee just to trade as well, and it's gotten very, very small. I mean, depending on what the equity trade is, I know for myself, I think I pay – Seven ninety nine per trade or something like that, but I, it's different for every different brokerage company. So, you, but we should check to see what that fee is up front before we decide to choose a brokerage firm. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, I think so. And then, you know, depending on what you are investing in, if you are investing in a stock or, as you said, you want to invest in a mutual fund, there may be specific fees 
for the mutual fund as well. There may be a front-loaded fee just to buy it the first time you buy it. There may be a back-loaded fee when you take out money. There may be a fee for that. Um, so it, you know, it really, it really depends on the company and it depends on the product that you're investing in. Great, great. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate your time today. Um, I want to um, thank all of our, our attendees and make sure that they visit um, SavvyLadies.org and register for, register for next week's um, seminar, which is um, with Isalt again doing Bonds 101, as she mentioned. Um, so again, thank you, Isalt. I really appreciate your time and effort. You put on an amazing presentation, and hopefully we'll all be brave enough to go and set up um, a brokerage account and start doing a little trading. So Great. I'm glad. That's, that's yeah. fantastic.